are going to be joined by Scott Wallace, who is um, Associate Professor in the Department of Journalism at the University of Connecticut. He's going to be speaking about U.S. interventions in Central America and the Middle East, a war reporter's journey. Hello. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and an honor. Um, my name is Scott Wallace, and for the past 40 years, I've been a journalist and photographer uh, who covers conflict and controversies from some of the world's more remote regions. I began my career uh, in the early 1980s covering the Civil War in El Salvador. Um, and ever since then, I've found that speaking to people on the ground and um, witnessing events for myself with my own eyes and ears uh, has produced a far more accurate picture for me than what I would have gotten um, by listening to uh, government-issued talking points in climate-controlled rooms. Um, I'd like to offer some quick observations gleaned from this approach, and uh, I would like to suggest that they have enduring relevance for some of the most pressing issues um, today, including uh, the immigration crisis, the treatment of civilians in wartime, and the unintended consequences of uh, pursuing moral, morally dubious policies, either out of expedience sake or out of a knee-jerk adherence to an ideological position. You might recall that uh, President Reagan entered the White House in 1981, vowing to draw the line against Soviet expansion in the hemisphere. He and his team of neoconservative hawks had little knowledge of Central America and bent what they saw through the prism of the Cold War. Thus, the Salvadoran rebels were the mere dupes of the USSR, Cuba, and Nicaragua, um, and the Cold Warriors could not admit that the guerrillas might be part of a homegrown movement uh, that had arisen from decades of brutality, abuse, and a succession of stolen elections. As a corollary to that narrative, uh, the US, uh, U.S. officials refused to acknowledge that the rebels were capturing much of their weaponry from the Salvadoran military on the fields of battle. They needed to believe, and they needed American taxpayers to believe, that the guerrillas were completely sustained by outside support. Of course, the rebels themselves told a very different story, and in 1983, which was the year I arrived in El Salvador, um, reporters could find them within an hour's drive of the capital. They claimed they were capturing their weapons from the Salvadoran army that we were supplying. More than once, I heard rebel commanders humorously thank El Senor Reagan for their weapons as they affectionately patted their M16s. There was actually plenty of evidence to support their claims. By 1983, the rebels were running roughshod across much of the country, seizing hundreds, if not thousands, of weapons in the process. Even U.S. officers in the field privately took issue with the official line emanating from Washington. One day, I accompanied a U.S. Army intelligence officer on a fact-finding mission to the front. Our helicopter touched down atop a strategic volcano where soldiers were recovering from a deadly attack by the guerrillas. The officer said he'd been pressing the Salvadoran brass for evidence that the rebels were getting their guns from Nicaragua. I keep asking them, show me the proof. I believe you. I just want to see the proof. They haven't shown me the proof. Of course, the Soviet Union was arming the Nicaraguans, uh, the Sandinistas in Nicaragua. And it was, but, but Nicaragua was a sovereign country with a government that the U.S. officially recognized. Nonetheless, you'll remember that President Reagan authorized the CIA to launch the secret war against Nicaragua with the purported aim of cutting off those alleged arms shipments to the Salvadoran rebels. Under that pretext, the, contra the CIA armed and trained the Nicaraguan counter-revolutionary rebels known as the Contras. Of course, actually, the Contras never interdicted anything. Their real purpose was to wreak havoc inside Nicaragua to roll back the Sandinistas' um, 
to roll back the Sandinista Revolution's social programs. They targeted schools, clinics, co-ops. So unsavory were their tactics that Congress cut off aid to the Contras, setting the stage for the Iran-Contra scandal. Back in El Salvador, the, uh, back in El Salvador, back in El Salvador, uh, death squads uh, linked to the government continued to ply the nighttime streets with impunity in the countryside. Uh, special Forces advisors, almost all of them veterans of Vietnam, uh, were doing their best to turn a brutal military into a modern counterinsurgency force. But the Army couldn't shake its reputation for indiscriminate violence against civilians in areas where the rebels held sway. U.S. trained units were responsible um, and took part in some of the war's most gruesome atrocities, including El Mosote Massacre, uh, where 900 women, children, and elderly were executed in cold blood. Salvadoran commanders shrugged off these accusations and U.S. officials acquiesced. In their view, the peasants were not exactly innocent civilians, but were involved in the furnishing of uh, uh, food and information to the rebels. Thus, they were not, you know, uh, they were kind of borderline legitimate targets. In fact, the Salvadoran military did re regard them as legitimate targets. With U.S. approval, the military preserved, pursued an aggressive strategy of ground assaults and aerial bombardments meant to drain areas under rebel control of civilians. Uh, our insistence on military solutions in Central America set in motion the immigration crisis that bedevils us to this day. One of the great unintended consequences of ideological, ideologically driven policymaking in Washington, the goal of defeating communism superseded all else, including reforms that would have strengthened the democratic center and human rights. Salvadoran officers would pay lip service to such niceties, uh, but they knew they could always invoke the threat of a communist takeover to shield their own, punish to shield their own from punishment and keep, keep U.S. aid flowing. As a general rule, guerrilla forces almost always seek to deploy the same weapons as their government adversaries. In the case of El Salvador, this truism was largely the result of the guerrillas seizing their American and Western arms on the battlefield, as I already mentioned. In the case of Nicaragua, where I moved to document the Contra War in 1985, the CIA furnished the Contras with Soviet-made AK-47s and other materiel the standard uh, weapon of the Sandinista army. The Contras could thus claim they were taking their guns off, the Sandinista ar uh, off their Sandinista enemies, except that they really weren't. In fact, the Ron Contra scandal uh, unraveled precisely because the Contras were almost wholly dependent on support from outside. You'll remember Oliver North's secret arms pipeline to the Contras was exposed when the Sandinistas shot down a resupply flight to the Contras that was loaded with crates of brand new AK-47s, which led to another unintended consequence of U.S. policy. One day in 1989, I encountered these guerrillas in a village in, in eastern El Salvador. Many were brandishing Soviet-made AK-47s. Years earlier, this discovery would have provoked howls of indignation here in Washington. So what accounted for this monumental shift? Well, it turned out the Contras had begun selling their weapons, their U.S.-supplied AK-47s, on the black market, and the Salvadoran guerrillas were buying. How ironic that the Contras, uh, who were supposed to choke off uh, weapons supplies bound for the Salvadoran rebels, had now become a conduit for them. And if that wasn't the case, it was curious that there was scarcely a peep out of Washington as more and more AK-47s turned up in El Salvador in rebel hands. Fast forward to the post-9-11 wars uh, in the Middle East. Uh, by 2001, the neoconservatives were once again in the ascendance, albeit with a new enemy to confront. Once again, ends would be used to justify means, and intelligence would be bent to satisfy 
the whim of policymakers, this time to provide a pretext for invading Iraq. The search for WMD proved to be a fool's errand, and soldiers trained to fight war were called upon instead to enforce the peace after the fall of Saddam. We're just going to piss a lot of people off, one soldier muttered to me one afternoon as his unit prepared for a raid that night on, an, on a Baghdad apartment complex. His prediction proved to be prophetic. The soldiers found no enemies that night, but they did make quite a few of them. Quite a f uh, they smashed in a lot of doors, hauled in a lot of people for questioning, and within weeks, an act of resistance would begin to inflict serious casualties on U.S. and coalition forces. The unintended consequences of the Iraq invasion will be with us for years to come, foremost among them the undermining of the rules-based international order, the erosion of our moral standing in the world, and the empowering of Iran. As in Central America and Vietnam before it, the United States expended great sacrifice in blood, treasure, prestige, and power each time in pursuit of dubious objectives. It's my hope that in the future uh, we will, um, our troops, when they are put down, on, when their boots are put down on the ground, will help secure the peace rather than sow mayhem. And um, that uh, in the future, as I said, this is, that never has this mission been more urgent than now. No, perhaps not since the end of World War II. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And my, my new book is uh, available, will be available in a couple of weeks. And so thank you very much. Appreciate it.